so I woke up today to yet another church scandal. Well, hello, my silky friends. How are you doing? All right. You know, I cover true crime, but it seems like these days, most of the crime is coming from inside the church. And as a Christian person, I have to report on it as well. This one, man, ugh, it's sickening. It is sickening. Let's dive right into it. This is as of June 15th. Gateway pastor Robert Morris admits moral failure after allegations of essaying a 12-year-old. A 12-year-old, y'all. Now, let me just give you some history. This pastor has admitted in the past, like a long time ago, that he had an indiscretion. And he said it was more of a... Uh, petting, kissing type of thing with no actual going all the way, if you know what I mean. So this congregation and the history, they know that this has happened. But what they didn't know is how bad it actually was. A blog recounting the essay of a woman when she was 12 years old by Gateway Pastor Robert Morris has prompted the Texas-based megachurch to acknowledge decades-old moral failure. However, in a statement to staff, the church did not note the age of the woman at the time of the inappropriate behavior, referring to her simply as a young lady. I'll say she was young. Gateway Church was founded in 2000 by Morris and has more than 100,000 people attending each weekend and their nine sites and online. On Friday morning, the Wartburg Watch published a story alleging that Pastor Morris had essayed Cindy Clemsher, Clemisher, a 54-year-old grandmother of three from Oklahoma, beginning in 1982 when she was 12. Around 4 p.m. yesterday, Executive Leader Pastor Thomas Miller sent a statement from Gateway's elders to church staff via the messaging platform Slack, according to sources close to the church. These sources also provided the Roy's report with a screenshot of the message from Miller and the elders' statement. Now, Morris does say that since that time, I have walked in purity and accountability in this area. Now, they also made a tweet saying that they have a statement and if anybody has questions or they're asking you things, they're not wanting you, look at that, what is in yellow. This statement is to empower you with a response if someone inquiries, not as something to proactively send out to people. So like, you know, kind of don't ask, don't tell. If they ask you, you can give them this statement. Now, this alleged abuse well, I don't think it's alleged anymore, but they're saying that it happened when he was a young traveling ev evangelist and uh, he and his wife, Morris's wife they're talking about, Debbie, were family friends and often stayed in a home of the Clemishers. Here's a picture of Robert Morris at this age. Now, it says that Cindy Clemisher shared a bedroom with her older sister at the time, but when the Morrises visited, he slept in the, their room while she and her sister slept in another room. But basically what happened is one night, he asked her to come and visit with him. Now, let me say this. If this was a one-time thing, still not okay, all right, still illegal, still should face prosecution, although the statute of limitations is... Far gone. Problem with this is that it didn't just happen one time. Oh no. It happened from the time she was 12 to around 16. Now, when she was 17, she told her parents about the abuse. And at this time, they were at Shady Grove Church. And 
According to this report, years later, when my father found out what happened, he told the lead pastor at Shady Grove Church that if Morris didn't get out of the ministry, he would report him to police. Now, in my opinion, he should have reported him to police. Anyway, after years of counseling, the woman reached out to a high-profile criminal defense attorney to file a civil lawsuit against Morris. Again, here is a picture of Morris as a young evangelist. I just wanted someone to pay for the years of counseling I went through, she said. Clemisher said Gateway offered her $25,000 if she would sign a non-disclosure agreement, which she refused. I wasn't wanting money. I wanted him to pay for the counseling I had gone through. In Morris' statement, he says he confessed and repented of his actions, stepped down from the, his ministry's position for two years, and he said he also received counseling and returned to the ministry two years later with the blessings of the young lady's father. However, Clemisher said her father did not bless Morris to returning to the ministry. We are instructed to forgive, but that does not mean my father gave his blessing. He wanted to kill him. So yeah, the church's response after all these years are, oh, we'll give you 25000 and you have to sign a non-disclosure. I mean, come on. It was 50000 in her expenses. Let, let's not even talk about the years of damages, okay? Because you know when something like this happens, it changes your whole life. But anyway, they're all feeling like, oh, well, we knew that there was an indiscretion. Maybe they didn't know she was 12, but he repented. He was sat down for two years, and then he went back into the ministry with her father's blessing. Now, the Morrises did go and talk to the family and ask for forgiveness, but that doesn't mean that the father said, okay, you are okay for ministry. You are clearly not fit for ministry. And we're going to talk a little bit about what disqualifies you and what do we do in these situations. Now, let's go to another thing that happened, yes, this week. All right, here we go. Tony Evans steps down. Yet another controversy for celebrity pastors in the USA. So this was published on June 13th. Evangelical pastor and radio host Tony Evans cited an unnamed sin as he stepped down as senior pastor at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, the latest controversy for high-profile pastors in America. Yeah. Evans will be temporarily, okay, temporarily stepping away from his senior pastor's duties. Okay, this is according to USA Today. The pastor said in a statement on the church's website that he has committed no crime, but he did not use righteous judgment in actions. Like, I don't know what this really even means, okay? Because in other reports, it does mention... Tony Evans having his own sin. So, because I was kind of confused by this. I'm like, are you just saying you didn't handle things properly and you're stepping down? Because I don't see any big pastor doing that. I really don't. One of the perils of celebrity is that you have this high profile status and a lot of the fame and fortune which comes with that and as well as additional publicity for your mistakes, it can definitely generate controversy around the faith. So there is a long history of this. Now, Tony Evans founded Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas in 1976, and it now has over 10,000 members. Of course, he has his books and all of his stuff. On Sunday, Evans released a statement, when we fall short of that standard due to sin, we are required to repent and restore our relationship with God. Now, remember that. Restore our relationship with God. A number of years ago, I fell short of that standard. I am, therefore, required to apply the same biblical standard of repentance and restoration to myself that I have applied to others. The decision wasn't sudden, according to church leaders who said he made his decision after tremendous prayer and multiple meetings with church elders. Probably, uh, they said, you're going to have to step down, buddy. So now we're left wondering, what do you do in these situations? Because here is the, the thing that everybody screams. All of these mega pastors are saying the same thing. They are saying the same thing. 
They are all quoting from Matthew 18, where we've talked about it, where if you find a brother in a fault, you go to him privately. If he doesn't listen, you take somebody else with you. If he still won't repent, then you take him before the entire congregation. If he won't repent, you kick him out. Now, hopefully, in one of those scenarios, he comes clean and he repents. But does that give him license to stand in the pulpit again? I'm going to say a big no. Now, God is concerned about reconciling to himself. We need to be reconciled to God for our sin. Not standing up in the pulpit and being tempted. It doesn't matter. You sit down for a year or two. You are not fit to have that position. Let's look at some of the Bible's qualifications for a pastor. Just if you need some clarity on who is qualified, okay? Here are some of the things with the scripture references. The first one, you have to be above reproach. Now, once you have already fallen, you are no longer above reproach. As a matter of fact, usually people have to keep an eye out on you, right? Yeah, you know what happened before him? Watch him around these women. Watch him around the the kids, the young guys, whatever. You are no longer, sir or madam, above reproach. All right. Must be devoted to his wife, a one-woman man. Um, A pastor's children must be in submission. Now, number three. There is a faithful steward. Steward. Let's talk about what that word means, okay? Here the term is used as overseer. Um, a manager, a steward of God's resources and Jesus' flock. He takes responsibility, but not ownership. In other words, the church is not mine. All this money is not mine. It belongs to God. I am merely the steward to make sure that it is all going in the right place and used responsibly. Wow. I can see where this would be a huge problem for a lot of pastors, can't you? Especially these mega churches. Just be humble, not arrogant. So, when they stand up with all of this glory and fanfare and talking about their books and their ministry, first of all, if it's your ministry, it's not God's. Y'all don't share this, okay? It's either God's or it's yours. God is not sharing with you. He is allowing you to participate in what he wants to do. Not sharing his glory with you. Okay, let's get that straight. Pastor must be gentle, not quick-tempered. Not a drunkard. Wow. Pastor must be peaceful, not violent. Financial integrity, not greedy for gain. So, how much are some of these people making? A lot. A lot. But there's always a reason, right? There's always have people stand up and, you know, even guest pastors come in and tell the congregation why their pastor is so, you know, fabulous and why he deserves all this because all of the heavy burdens that he carries. And, you know, he deserves a gazillion dollars a, a year. Right? According to the Bible, he is not greedy for gain. A pastor is to be upright in his financial dealings and not accused of pursuing money over the kingdom of God. Wow, how many people can we say that about? Okay, he has got to be a uh, hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled in every area of area of his life. Uh oh. A pastor must be holy. Oh, no. Really? Uh, His life is devoted wholeheartedly to Jesus, externally and internally. Well, if you're all devoted to Jesus, let me tell you, you ain't got time to be diddling the people in the congregation, okay? Be able to teach. Yeah, hopefully you're not plagiarizing from somewhere, (laughs) someone else, and that happens a lot. Must be spiritually mature, respectable, and an example to the flock. This is 1 Peter 5.3. Let's look at that for a second. Not domineering over 
over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock, examples of servanthood. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. So, how many qualified pastors do you know? <laughs> with that and let me tell you tolerate these kind of things because the church is you know we, we've got the superstar celebrity pastors they're up on a pedestal what will happen to the church if you don't have them as the leader right let me tell you a big shocker right here if the church falls apart because of the leadership not being in their place that anointed one that charismatic one, if your church can't stand easily without that person being there, then that church is built on man and not on God at all. At all. Think about it. Is your church dependent upon your pastor and his charisma and how much people love him because what he's doing is he's setting you up to worship him not god i not like it but that's the truth it is what it is all right i hate to talk about this but it you know you have to call out what you have to call out and this is a big one and honestly like i said before i think this is good news all of this stuff i know it's horrible we hate to hear it it's heartbreaking but we really need to change what we look at in leadership and remember what it is what is so exciting about this to me is that god cannot change clean up judge whatever the world around us if he doesn't start in his house so it seems to me that he is starting in his house and all of these people are coming forward and you know people are dropping off whatever if that destroys your of god and and rocks you religiously and rocks you spiritually then you need to go back to the foundation because the foundation is jesus christ himself okay anything short of that is going to be fallible but we don't need to keep putting it back in the pulpit and saying oh well you're restored no you no longer fit the description of what a pastor is yes be re reconciled to god absolutely can you still be effective for the kingdom in other areas yes yes you sure can but you are no longer qualified to stand in the pastor position i'm sorry bye bye mega millions and you ought to be happy about that because you don't want to stand and have to answer to God for what you did. Because there will be that day. So anybody who is in this position, you need to actually be grateful that things come out and you have the chance to get it right before you have to stand and answer for it. Okay? I really, really hate to talk about this. It breaks my heart. But it's truth, and it's things that people are not going to tell you because they want to keep doing what they're doing. All right, I love you all. Stay safe. Whatever you do, whew, try to stay silky, okay? Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.